Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow, we have a few awake. Good morning, everyone. All right, there we go. There we go. It is uh, wonderful to be here. Um, just before I get going, I want to highlight a couple of things. Uh, thank you for those announcements. And um, yeah, I mean, Ashley deserves a clap because she says more in about a minute and a half than I do in about 30 minutes. So um, I think you're sitting there right now going, I wish I could slow down Ashley and speed up Pastor Bud. And then that way the service be a lot shorter. And so, but uh, there we go. Uh, we have that happening. Uh, I want to say that uh, the members that we will be putting forward um, uh, have been in the Hillmark Covenant family for years and years and years. Uh, the members that are going to be forwarded are Mark and Peggy uh, Dooley. Uh, that's, that's really cool. And then also uh, Genesis and Ashley Vargas. So isn't that cool? That's, that's very neat that we have um, four people coming forward who are part of the Hillmark Covenant family and taking that step forward. Uh, and then also, uh, Theo, Pastor Theo mentioned it in his prayer, but afterwards, we're going to head right on out and uh, dedicate the columbarium, and uh, even though we did do a, uh, a memorial service, a celebration of life for Bill, we're also going to do the inurnment uh, for him uh, this, the, uh, following the service. And so join us for that. We have refreshments. We have, we have all of that. So... Um, these last three messages that I wanted to give here at Hillmark um, really have to do with uh, single words that I want to um, almost pray over you as I head out. Transitions aren't easy. They're just not fun. Uh, there's a lot of change. There's a lot of What's going to happen next? There's a lot of chaos, uh, just the unknown. And, and walking through that can be incredibly difficult. And so I have three words that I want to impress upon you and remind you. And thank you, Art, for, for pointing that out, that Psalm uh, 16 is a psalm of trust. It's a psalm of putting our faith and our emotions and our lives in the pathway of God. And so as we do that together, it builds our trust not only for the Lord, but with one another. And that is something that we've been talking a lot about in these months. And I pray that really uh, as, I, as I transition out and as your next uh, transitional pastor comes in and, and even as the next pastor steps in, my prayer is that you have the hope um, that you have today and that e it even grows. Uh, I remember coming in in October and November and having many conversations with people and uh, there wasn't a lot of hope. Uh, there was some bewilderment. There was some questioning what, what's going on. Um, there was some uh, wondering what's going to happen. There was even some fear as to the future of Hillmar Covenant and what God may do and what God may have happen here. But I want to say that I love the meetings that I have now with many of our council members, with our staff, and with our congregation in that there is hope. There's dreaming and, and creativity and seeing God tangibly at work in our families and in our lives and in our church. And so, so much fun uh, to have those conversations. And so, this morning, I want to talk about delight, delight, this idea of delighting in the midst of transition and finding a sense of joy and finding a sense of fun and finding a sense of excitement and passion in the midst of this moment. This week, many of you could tell, I got a haircut. Uh, I, I went in and got my haircut, and uh, people are going, no, I, I don't. Well, that, that's kind of what happened. I went in. Uh, this is my, my second to last time with my, with my barber, and uh, I have a good uh, relationship with Josue. 
and uh, I sit down, and, and, uh, and he goes, same thing, and I say, yes, normally, but this time, I actually had a picture that I showed him, and I go, I'm really trying to do this with my beard, and uh, trying to kind of give it, give it more full and more length, because I have a fat head, and uh, when you have a fat head, uh, it, I, I just don't like having a fat head, and so I want my beard to kind of go longer to give you the illusion that I have a longer, thinner head. And hopefully that'll carry on to the rest of my body, you know? And so I'm explaining that to Josue, and he's kind of looking at it. He's going, okay, all right. You know, mumbles something in Spanish, and he says, okay, sounds good. And so he's cutting my hair, and as he's got me leaning back, and he's trimming my beard, and he's doing his straight razor uh, shave on my cheeks. He's humming. He's finding delight. I'm thinking, this guy is finding so much delight and joy in his job until I figured out he was humming the theme song to Mission Impossible. (laughs) So here I am. This is what you have. That's what you have. You have delight. I want to read out of one of the Gospels. I'm going to read out of uh, Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. I, I got to stop there. We, we read these stories and we go, oh yeah, another healing story of Jesus. I mean, think about this. If you were walking down the street or you went to go have coffee with a friend and you were sitting with them and that you would ask them, what happened today in your life? And they say, you wouldn't believe this. You know, Joan... Joan is, she's been crippled for years. She hasn't been able to walk straight. She hasn't been able to stand up. She's been sick. She's been affirmed and everything else. And a guy comes walking by a teacher and he says, you're healed. Put both hands on her. And she stood up and walked away. What would you do? Would you just go, oh yeah, I hear those stories all the time. No, you would be amazed at this. Indignant because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Is that going to be your first thought? Well, you, wait a minute. You can't heal on the Sabbath. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can't, you can't, you can't touch her. What about the Me Too movement? You touch her, oh man, everything goes out the door. This is what they concentrated on was that he healed on the Sabbath. Not that he healed somebody who was infirmed. The synagogue leaders said to the people, there are six days for work. So come and be healed on those days. Not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall to lead it out to give it water? Which is just common sense. I mean, we, we, we're going to give water to our animals even on the seventh day, even though it's work. Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day? From what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. I'm going to go quick because June is just a packed month here at Hillmark Covenant, and uh, and we just are already heading into the end of the service, and we have our columbarium. So I'm going to go really quick this morning. Okay. Do I have permission to do that? All right. Yeah. <laughs> Got some cheers. Amen, pastor. Yeah, go. Uh, Theo's over there going, yeah, he's lying. Um, 
But, uh, <laughs> by the way, I'm impressed that Theo not once mentioned that he graduated. <laughs> not once during graduation and honoring that. So congratulations, Theo, for not mentioning it. Congratulations. But anyway, I want to give you some ways, some pathways where you could find delight in the midst of this transition time, where you could find delight in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the questioning, in the midst of what's going on. And the first pathway of finding, chaos, uh, finding delight is this idea of surrounding yourself with godly people. This is from Psalm 16.3. This is in the NIV, although I loved the message version. That's why I asked to have that read at the beginning. But it says, I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. My delight is in the holy people of the Lord. I want to tell you this. I want to tell you graduates this as you head off to school as you head off to the next stage, I want to tell uh, students this as you're not in the midst of graduation. Eighth grade graduation, I think you need to be recognized. Middle school, junior high was the worst time of my life. I hated that time. Kids, middle kid, school kids are brutal. And they are just, I mean, you get in that atmosphere, it's like a dog-eat-dog -dog world, man. And they call each other names and they look at each other. I mean, you, oh, it's terrible. But you know, the psalmist points out that our delight should be found in surrounding ourselves with godly people. There is nothing more important, I think, when it comes to finding delight in your world and delight in your day-to-day -day life than surrounding yourself with godly people. Because when we tend to surround ourselves with negative people, when we tend to surround ourselves with people who want to kind of destroy and destruct, when we, tend, when we surround ourselves with people who want to drag others down, it is not a delightful life. It doesn't bring joy. It doesn't bring passion. It doesn't bring excitement into our life. But when we surround ourselves with godly people who rejoice in the presence of the Lord, who love that God is at work in the midst of life and could see God at work, not only in their lives, but in our lives, it creates delight. It creates joy. And so that's the first thing is surround myself with godly people. So if you're in the doldrums, if you're in the midst of kind of not seeing hope and not seeing what God is doing, if you're in the midst, the first question I want you to ask yourself is, who am I surrounding myself with? If I'm surrounding myself with negative people, if I'm surrounding myself with people who are just going to drag this down, if I'm surrounding myself with people who have a hard time or at least don't talk about where God is at work but only concentrate on where things aren't meeting their expectations, let me tell you something. I'm going to be very blunt with you. Find a new group of friends. Okay? Surround yourself with godly people. The second area in here... The second pathway of living a delightful life, of filling your life with delight, is secure yourself with God's gifts. I need to secure myself with what God gives me, not the other things in life. A lot of times we find our security in other areas of life. What I can accomplish, my own success, what I can, what I can accumulate, Sometimes we, we look at it and I secure myself in the fact that my kids are doing well. And then when they share me, when they're having a hard time or when they're struggling, then my life becomes more unstable. This is where we need to secure ourselves. What has God given us? The psalmist writes, Lord, you alone, not what I can accomplish. It's a psalm of David, not what my position in the midst of society not, how, not where I am in the midst of, of the court or in the midst of, of royalty. But you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. 
The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Now look at Dave's, David's life. Dave, yeah, we're good friends. Um, but look at David's life. He had this life where the boundary lines, the things that happen, he's fleeing a king. A king's trying to kill him. He has all of these things happen in life. He has his most embarrassing moment in life recorded for all eternity in Scripture. Okay? He has an affair and kills the woman's husband. And that is in Scripture for eternity. Think about that. How many of you would like the worst part of your life in Scripture? But yet he still says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. David is still understanding it's what God gives me. It's the inheritance of what the Lord pours upon him. And what he has in the Lord, that's what brings his security. If your security is founded in how many people are in the seats, if your security is found in Hillmark Covenant, if your security is found in the, the, the end uh, um, balance sheet, if your security is found in the programs and all of those things that we do, you're going to be disappointed. Have your security found in the things that God gives us. The blessings that God pours upon us. And the third one that I want to put in this highlight here is that we need to seek Jesus' approval over people's appreciation. And that's what I, why I read out of Luke 13. If you look at that Last verse that I read, when he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. It could have been easy to lean on the appreciation of the religious leaders of the day. It could have been easy to lean upon the appreciation of those around you. But we need to seek Jesus' approval over the appreciation of others. Isn't that also what one of the temptations of Jesus is in the wilderness? As he's, as he's being tempted in the midst of the wilderness, he's, 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 he's in this moment. And one of, the, one of the temptations is that, you know, people will come and praise you. So that, do this so that people will praise you. And Jesus seeks out his father's approval before he seeks out people's appreciation. You see, those three steps are going to bring you delight in the midst of life. But not only that, but we can delight in the Lord and delight in him and delight in these things because, quite frankly, God delights in us. I mean, that brings me joy when I think that God delights in us. Zephaniah chapter 3 says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. This is the Lord. He's the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you but will rejoice over you with singing. A few weeks ago, we watched the video of nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. God finds delight and joy in you. When I was young, uh, growing up, and, and probably I was in middle school at this time, I might have been in fifth or sixth grade, but I remember... Um, Doing something, I don't exactly know what it was, but I sure know what the result was when my parents found out. I ended up at home, and I ended up in restriction, I ended up in my room, and I ended up with all of these things that I couldn't do. And I remember sitting in my room thinking, there's no way my, and my dad was the one who doled out the punishment, there's no way my dad loves me or likes me. 
I think I just meant like. I mean, I'm, I'm in trouble. There's not, I'd come out for dinner, and he's just miserable looking at me, giving me the evil eye, you know, because I did something wrong, and I probably deserved it, but I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my goodness. I went back in my room and, and all of this, and my dad comes in, and I really only remember a handful of conversations with my dad when I was young. But I remember this one. When he looked at me and he said, Bud, I really enjoy watching you live life. I smile. I mean, you, you have more fun in a boring moment than anybody else I know. And then he left the room. He didn't even say, oh, but this is, a, and he didn't even correct me or anything else. He just said, I love watching you have fun. He delighted in that I enjoyed life. I think we need to remember God delights in us. When we come here on Sunday morning, our goal should be to bring our Heavenly Father a great big smile as we praise His name, as we greet one another, as we come together. As we head out into the world, as we go through our lives, whether it's work or retirement or school or summer or whatever it is, we should just embrace and enjoy the life that God gave us and delight in that. But most of all, delight in the fact He delights in us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. We thank you for the amazing gifts you give us. We thank you for the gift of, of life, the gift of godly friends, the gift of your approval, the gift of your embrace. And as we are reminded, as we observe communion together, the gift of your son and the life that he brings. Father, help us delight. Help us not become bound up in negativity and, and, and cynicism and crit criticism, but help us delight in your presence and in the presence of your people. In Jesus' name we pray.